we go back one second to what I said after the FS lecture. We need to, uh, to translate. Translation needs thinking. And uh, if there is one thing that we really need, it's a thinking translation or thinking translators. But uh, we also need to uh, understand what identity it is to have no identity, dear F. It's not the topic of my lecture. Uh, my lecture is called, uh, oh, the title I gave was Image and Sovereignty. Uh, and uh, you see, I'm not showing you any image. As uh, Marie-José Monzin would say, the images are not done to be seen. You can imagine them. And you will see which images you need to imagine. It's a question of imagination. Uh, I will begin with uh, confession. Uh, 15 years ago, in 1999, during the American intervention in Serbia, there was uh, a lot of reactions in the United States and in Europe, different reactions. In uh, the United States, the intellectuals were mostly, or in the universities I know, at, at Columbia anyway, uh, against the, the American intervention for different reasons, but understandable reasons. In Europe, strangely, they were mostly in favor of the American intervention, as you know. And that's a confession. I happened to have signed, not written, but signed a text uh, published in Le Monde in favor of the American intervention. Written or signed, it amounts to the same. That was the confession part. But you remember, in these days, Habermas wrote uh, an, an article that uh, until now seems to me uh, essential, strange and essential. The debate was about the legitimacy of the American intervention. And of course, Habermas was so much in favor of the intervention, he had to justify the intervention in one way or another. Then, what was the justification? The justification was that if, yes, it's not legitimate because it's not authorized by the international law. Okay, but it anticipates the international law to come. Then the, this, this anticipation is justifying the violence. It's a, a law inventing, creating violence in uh, Walter Benjamin terms. Uh, but you understand what this means. It means uh, in uh, Habermas' mind, the institution of uh, universal sovereignty. The question is, is that not a contradiction in the terms? A universal sovereignty? Can you imagine anything like that? That was my introduction. Okay. Uh, then, when I gave the title Image on Sovereignty, I asked myself after giving the title, I was very much tormented for days and weeks, uh, will I once again develop uh, Agamben's apocalyptic theory of sovereignty and orient my talk toward a political or post-political understanding of the word sovereignty? Or will I follow the intricate, uh, intricacies of Georges Bataille's failed theory of sovereignty, try to understand why it was doomed to failure from the beginning, and in any way distinguish in the word sovereignty um, two dimensions, the political dimensions and the sacrificial dimension maybe, <sighs> or maybe it's more complicated than that. This is not the good uh, position to make. You know that in the last uh, 10 years of his life, uh, Bataille tried to systematize his thinking uh, 
by distributing his writings into two large units, the one of the A theological summa, and uh, the other one, which was much less clear in his mind, uh, which began uh, by a published book, which was the book on the accursed share, which was a book of political economy, according to his categories, uh, but of which the volumes uh, two and three were never published and probably never completed. Volume two on the history of eroticism and volume three on sovereignty. Uh, Agamben has his own idea on the question why the volume devoted to sovereignty was never achieved, completed. Uh, his idea, which he made public in a colloquium devoted to Bataille uh, long ago and before Homo Sacer, uh, in Italian, Il Politico Il Sacro, and a bit later, in Homo Sacer. In the latter, the passage on Bataille sovereignty comes at the end of the second part, where Agamben has explained the, you know, the connection between the eminently political concept of sovereignty and what he calls bare life on the heads of Benjamin, where bare life <coughs> represents the excluded part in the political life of the city, and sovereignty, the capacity of deciding about the exception and consequently about the exclusion. Agamben's explanation of Bataille's failure is then the following. It is true that unwittingly Bataille recognized bare life as a figure related to sovereignty, it, it's dark obverse, so to speak, but I quote, instead of recognizing bear life's eminently political nature, he inscribes the experience of this life both in the sphere of the sacred and in the interiority of the subject. For him, Agamben, life, it's a quotation, still remains bewitched in the ambiguous circle of the sacred. End of quotation. To say it briefly, Bataille's thinking of sovereignty was not political enough, and he was enmeshed in the dubious categories of the anthropology of his day, in particular, the anthropology of religion. The conceptual apparatus of sacrifice and eroticism cannot grasp the bare life of Homo Sacer, and this is shown, according to Agamben, by Bataille's interest in the pictures of the young Chinese torture victim. You all know probably this image. Uh, Bataille was obsessed with this image from the beginning of his life to the end, you know. Uh, Agamben refers only to the last book in this passage of Bataille, The uh, uh, Tears of Eros, Les Larmes de Ross, uh, by, which uh, Bataille has composed when he was very ill, in fact at the very end of his life. But this image was before his eyes from the beginning, from 26 to his, uh, to his death, for 40 years. And it's uh, the image of a uh, torture image. And uh, this, that is the image that I'm not showing. Then you can imagine an image of torture. And But I had many images of torture in his mind, and in particular, uh, painters that uh, represented uh, atrocities, tortures of any, any every sort. And uh, that's the whole uh, of it. I mean, uh, Gagomben doesn't say anything else about Bataille's failure uh, in his uh, treatise on sovereignty. This reference to the use of the images by Bataille in order to explain the insufficiency of his treatment of sovereignty is interesting in itself, but it just shows that Agamben clearly is not willing to make any effort to understand uh, the connection done by Bataille, uh, but of course never made explicit by him, uh, between the sovereign experience or the inner experience as an experience of sovereignty and the image as simulacrum. And consequently, if there is an urgency of thought, something that needs to be thought urgently, it is this strange and totally unexpected connection between the image as simulacrum and sovereignty. But, and here I'm skipping something probably very important and I'll come to this later, is the question of what is the experience for Bataille, and then who is the sovereign subject who is uh, going through the inner experience. Uh, what urges us to systematize, or to thematize the con connection between image and sovereignty is another question whose formulation maybe will make you more attuned to this question of urgency raised by the organizers of this conference, and this question is, very simple question, who comes after the sovereign? 
what then I first want to show is that it, this was the question that triggered and informed the philosophical reflection on sovereignty in recent times. Agamben, Benjamin, Derrida, all of them. Uh, and of course the question who comes after the sovereign echoes another question, the one uh, asked almost 30 years ago by my professor of philosophy, uh, Jean-Luc Nancy, who comes after the subject. You know that book? The two questions obviously are not unrelated. And I will begin with Walter Benjamin. Walter Benjamin, in his powerful essay on, his critique of viol on the critic of violence, the essay in which, if we believe Agamben, if we believe Agamben, he was already inaugurating the debate with Carl Schmitt through a general interrogation on the nature, the essence, or the historical and universal functioning of state power. In German, you know, Gewalt can mean violence, of course, but also very simply power, state power. And of course, the essay is, is a critique of state power, nothing else. Then uh, he had clearly the ambition of bringing to the light the underpinnings of political sovereignty as a structure, as a system, and as our historical curse. He did not do that at all along the lines of what would later become the liberal theory of sovereignty, the one best represented by Habermas. On the contrary, he took seriously Carl Schmitt's arguments about the necessity and the reality of the concept of sovereignty in order to account for the law of the state, the legal order, any legal order. He rephrased Carl Schmitt's formulations about the two types of power constituent, constituted in terms of a violence that creates the law and a violence that preserves the law. You all know that. He brought these two types of violence or power under a single qualification by considering them as the two sides of the same coin, the coin of mythical power or mythical violence. And to this mythical violence, he opposed the violence for which, for which he had no other name, but he had a name, but uh, divine violence, just because he read maybe some of its manifestations in the Jewish tradition. It was for him a way of laying bare both the possibility of and the justification for a final revolution that would bring an end to the sovereignty of the state. In other terms, to the continuous rising and falling of what he had called mythical power, the rising and falling of law creating and law preserving violences of constituent and constituted powers. The problem is how did he conceive the temporality of this final revolution? It's a question of who comes after the sovereign. Benjamin was the first one to ask himself who comes after the sovereign? Was this final revolution a means for him for distinguishing the time of the mythical and the time of the divine? And through this distinction, a means for better characterizing the mythical time, which is our historical time? In that case, the message or the conclusion would be our myth historical time is a mythical time. And you know that a few years later, Marinos uh, reminded us that, uh, this just a few minutes ago, in the book on the German Baroque drama, or the Trauerspiel, uh, he would describe the object of the morning play as precisely the same historical time brought on the stage, and now more explicitly, not only as a mythical time, but a catastrophic time. The mournful and melancholic experience of the morning play as a genre, he would say, is the experience of the catastrophe. History as catastrophe. And he was also probably the first one to say anything like that that we need to understand what the experience of catastrophe means because we don't know. In spite of all the discourses about, about uh, the genocides of the century. And number two, uh, we also need, and this is maybe still more difficult, to understand what uh, Benjamin uh, meant with history as catastrophe. 
And obviously, the final revolution of the essay on the critic of violence, understood that way, is not a revolution that would open the gates for a new history in which we would finally get rid of political violence and political sovereignty. It is rather a hypothetic end of history. End of history. Hypothetic is not the good word, but it's an, it's an idea of the end of history that makes possible our understanding of history because there is nothing else but history. And we are within understanding of history as the rise and fall of political violence. And, but, in his explicit wording, Walter Benjamin's final revolution, and it's a but, it's not an and. Now I, I'm saying the contrary of what I said before. In his explicit wording, Benjamin's final revolution can also be read as a revolution in real time. Um, which will make possible a new beginning. In the last paragraph of the essay on violence, you know, Benjamin, one last time, describes the cycle of rising and falling in the law-making and law-preserving forms of violence. And then he writes, I quote, I quote in English, I translate, or I read the translator here. On the breaking of this cycle maintained by mythic forms of law, it's a long sentence, a new historical epoch is founded. Wow, a new historical epoch. And the next sentence is, if the rule of myth is broken occasionally in the present age, the coming age, wow, there is a coming age, is not so unimaginably remote than an attack on law, ein Wort gegen das Recht. In English, you know, they have difficulties to translate das Recht. The law is always the law. Gesetz und Recht, the same word in English. An attack on law is altogether futile. The problem is that, as I said, we read the English and not the German original. And almost everything in the translation of the essay on violence in English is based on an interpretation, which can be right or wrong. For instance, the first sentence of this last paragraph of the essay in English reads as follows, I read. The critique of violence is the history of its his excuse me, I, I can begin again. The, the, the critique of violence is the philosophy of its history. Critique of violence is the philosophy of its history. The, the philosophy of the history of violence. Mm. We don't understand. And he explains. Wow. Well, he will explain. The philosophy of this history because only the, the idea of its development makes possible a critical approach to its temporal data. Then he gives the explanation why it is philosophical. The problem is that it's a wrong translation. In German, uh, it's uh, the philosophie dieser Geschichte, deswegen weil die Idee ihres Ausgangs allein eine kritische b -b -b uh, Einstellung uh, ermöglicht. The word Ausgang in German uh, has never meant development, the level development of its history. Never. It means exit, a way out, end. It's, he's speaking about the end of history. The translator here does not accept very simply that Benjamin considers the critic of violence as the philosophy of its history just because history needs to be considered from the point of view of its end. It's way out, it's achievement, it's final result from the point of view of a decisive suspension of the legal order, from the point of view of a final state of exception in order for us to have a critical view of its temporal data. It's interesting to see how translators in general have a problem with the end of history. You, I'll explain that another time. Uh, although history was so sacred that it's impossible to imagine that someone could criticize or simply deconstruct history as such. I mean, as a discipline also. Yes, also as a discipline. Then, 
What was at stake for Benjamin clearly was the possibility of making plausible the question, who comes after the sovereign? And the critique of violence is first and foremost a critique of sovereignty. Benjamin writes, and there is an enormous ambiguity in Benjamin's wording, you have understood that. He writes, if the existence of violence beyond the law, jenseits des Rechts, again, is assured as pure immediate violence, this furnishes proof that revolutionary violence is possible. Then again, it's the same ambiguity. Uh, but uh, here again, there is a problem with the translator. Uh, at the very end of the, the, the essay, Walter uh, Benjamin is using the word valtant for, viol for the divine violence. Uh, then a translator translates sovereign violence. Wow, why? Valtan sovereign, then the translator means that after sovereignty there is still sovereignty? Maybe, but not sure. We don't know precisely. It's a question of the temporality of the, of the temporality of what? Temporality of this final revolution. The same ambiguity exists when we read Agamben's Homo Sake, and much more terrible, and without any, uh, any, any reflection, in fact. I will not offer the entire demonstration, of course, here. Suffices to say that Agamben characterizes the entire historical time from the beginning, he says, that is his expression, and I hope he controls the translations of his translators, as pervaded by the sovereign ban. The sovereign ban, you know, is the structure of the political. He, then, it defines our understanding and therefore our practice of the political. What does it do? It originally produces bare life, which means a life which is excluded from the legal order, be it human or divine. A life which therefore has no legal or sacrificial value, a life that can be kill, killed or simply ignored, by, but which is not for all that natural life because it remains under the spell of its being outside of the law, which means under the law also, both at the same time. What is extremely paradoxical, it's not that being outside or inside the law at the same time. The, what is extremely paradoxical is that for the sake of his own demonstration, Agamben needs, you know, Foucault's concept of the bell political, that modern type of power uh, uh, that exercises its pervasive influence directly on life through the control of bodies and the management of populations, but begins its reign after the end of sovereign power, which for Foucault was characterized by the, characterized by the power of death. Then, you know, uh, you see, Agamben transforms entirely Foucault's idea of the biopolitical and makes it the core element of the sovereign ban with one more essential caveat. One, uh, only today, he says, only today, in the 20th century, he was still in the 20th century, uh, with the paradigm of the concentration camps, the increasing in distinction between law and life, and the announced generalized state of exception, does the sovereign ban make itself felt with all its destructive sway. When all is said and done, here again, the question then is, who comes after the sovereign? And at least Benjamin had a, uh, a word for after the sovereign. He doesn't have any idea of what comes after the sovereign. Of course not. And the ambiguity that I was mentioning is much more troubling in the case of Agamben, because the end of sovereignty is already upon us with this apocalyptic generalized state of exception, but we don't see any end for this end, except the apocalypse itself. Agamben needs an apocalyptic revelation of the truth of sovereignty in order to get rid of the sovereign structure that is predicated on the production of bare life, and today on the generalization of this same bare life. The problem is that this sovereign structure at the core of our definition and our experience of the political is, he says, originary. It is from the beginning. We then need to terminate this structure that characterizes our Western and globalized practice of the political in order to usher into a politics, again a politics, freed from the sovereign ban and its lethal production of bare life. I must confess, second confession, that I am a bit tired of his, this apocalyptic tone recently adopted in philosophy. Uh, but, as Derrida would say, 
but conversely, I find a bit, uh, I, I find even Derrida's mild optimism a bit too optimistic when 200 years after Kant, and without any trace of irony, now it's Derrida, two lines only, but be careful. He, Derrida, and this is a translation of Gill, if I'm not mistaken, in a text that uh, Derrida pronounced in Paris, uh, I don't remember, at the end of the 90s, 80s, and where the English translation has been published very recently in a book called uh, Living Together. Uh, then I was saying, uh, without any trace of irony, Derrida recognizes, I quote, the sign at the very least of the possibility of humanity's irreversible progress. Of, because of what? Because of the globalization of, of our world. Uh, and uh, despite all his reservations uh, related to the global theater of, of our world and forgiveness, this marks something beyond national law. Derrida is speaking, and even perhaps beyond the politics capable of dealing only with the sovereignty of the nation state. Then the, he sees in the theater of Avoal, I, will, I cannot speak more about this, this is the object of another uh, lecture, but uh, himself, uh, maybe the uh, beyond sovereignty, uh, which for him is the, the sovereignty of the nation, nation state, but it's something beyond sovereignty. It's just, again something that comes after, after sovereignty, after the sovereign. Who comes after the sovereign? And this bring me, brings me to the last part of my speech. We saw how reluctant uh, Agamben was to engage into a discussion with Bataille uh, about this, his concept and his experience of sovereignty and how superficially he explained Bataille's failure in his project to complete the series of the accursed share with a whole book on sovereignty. Another explanation is given by Etienne Balibar in an article initially written for the Dictionnaire Européen de Philosophie and reprinted in his most recent book, Citizen, uh, Citoyen Sub Sujet in French, uh, which, by the way, gives a prominent place to this same article with the same title, Citizen Subject, which Balibar had written as an answer to Nancy's question, who comes after the subject? Uh, in this article, Balibar quotes the strange and extremely revelatory footnote in which Bataille says, I quote, le sujet, c'est pour moi le souverain. For me, the subject is a sovereign, which is a beautiful sentence, speculative sentence, a la Hegel. Uh, and he mentions the fact that Bataille, Bataille's book was doomed to failure, or at least to being interrupted, just because of the obstacle encountered by Bataille in what I would call myself the revolution of the subject. Haha, <laughs> the revolution of the subject, since the word subject, when considered as the, as the subject of, uh, excuse me, uh, considered as the subject of sovereign decision, means exactly the contrary of what it meant, and meant exclusively uh, until the 18th century, to wit, the subject of the sovereign. Until the, uh, again, uh, I explained this in one sentence. Uh, until the 17th century, let's say, the subject in European languages, le sujet in French, is more or less before its uh, philosophical use in the, at the end of the 18th century, uh, the uh, subjectus, the, uh, the, the subjected to the sovereign. And suddenly, it, uh, it means, it begins to mean exactly the contrary of what it meant. Uh, it means uh, the subject of the sovereign decision. Uh, then it's a, a revolution of the subject, and this is the topic more or less of Balibar's article. Uh, Geoffrey Bennington has also attended to this revolution in his own terms on the heats of Derrida's reflection about sovereignty uh, in uh, Without Alibi. Then, what is the context of that note in Bataille's book on sovereignty? I quote. Now it's Bataille. Bataille is speaking. If I spoke about objective sovereignty, I never lose sight of the fact that sovereignty is never really objective, that on the contrary designates uh, the prof profound subjectivity. In the world of things, we see the power relations. Undoubtedly, the isolate element must be submitted to the influence of the whole, but it is out of the question that he be subjected to it. Subjection supposes a different relationship, the one of the object to the subject. And I only uh, read this uh, lines because it is here that suddenly uh, Bataille places a footnote where he says the usage of the sovereign who used to say, my, uh, I, I'm, it's my translation, I apologize, it's a bad translation. Uh, 
uh, the usage of the sovereign who used to say my subjects introduces an equivocity or an equivocacy. How do, you, do they say in English, uh, Gil? Equivocity or equivocacy? That I, huh? equivocity. equivocity, that I cannot possibly avoid. Uh, the subject for me is the sovereign. The subject that I'm talking about is not at all subjected. Uh, when quoting this footnote, Bennington adds a very ironic maybe. And for Bataille, this double usage of the word subject, which is uh, uh, this uh, extraordinary word in French, which means itself and its contrary, uh, of the word subject, is just the result of a pun, a play with words, ce jeu de mots inévitable et malvenu, Bataille says. It's, uh, it's an undesirable play with words. Uh, undesirable, maybe, uh, but very effective for historical and philosophical reasons that Bataille himself doesn't want to take into account. What interests him is the pseudo-phenomenological description of the experience of the sovereign subject, and more precisely, the experience of the individual in the crowd who spends a large part of his or her time working for the sovereign, but recognizes himself in, in or herself in the sovereign. He says, I quote, the sovereign summarizes the essence of the subject through which and for which instant, the miraculous instant, is the sea into which the rivers of labor are flowing. End of quotation. Clearly, Bataille has some difficulties with the word subject, but no less clearly, these difficulties are part of the problem. The subject is the sovereign. What a beautiful statement <coughs> with its speculative meaning, for which at the same time Batal doesn't want to see and to explore the revolution of the subject that happened in the course of the 18th century. And I will say just a few more words about that strange book called Sovereignty, which has not been too much studied, I must say, in the last, uh, in the, uh, since its publication 20, 20 years ago. It begins with a, you know, as a, with a theoretical part, uh, and the theoretical part itself begins with a no less strange sentence, I quote, the sovereignty about which I'm talking has very little to do with the sovereignty of the states, the one that is defined by international law. Ah, then he is speaking about another sovereignty, ah, but he uses the same term. Why, Bataille, why? It should be the object of an investigation in political philosophy to see how the sovereignty of the states and the sovereignty of the sovereign within a state, or without state, by the way, in archaic societies, uh, are related to each other. But Bataille is not worried by this coincidence either. He defines sovereignty economically, economically you know, according to the principles of the accursed share. The sovereign is he who does not accumulate. Very simple definition. He also doesn't work, of course, if he doesn't accumulate. In archaic societies, the, ob the objective institution of sovereignty was supposed to represent that principle or that experience of non-accumulation. Non-accumulation means that the sovereign or supposed subject as sovereign lives in the instant, precisely the miraculous instant. He dissipates the riches of those who are laboring and accumulating. The question that occupies then a large section of this unfinished book concerns the communist society as instantiated um, uh, by the Soviet Union of that time, the extent to which there is still a possibility of sovereignty, that's Bataille's question, in that type of society, and because the answer is no, uh, then uh, what remains to do? if uh, and when any trace of the archaic and medieval institutions of sovereignty, because sovereignty is an institution, it's political after all, for Bataille. You understand it's political after all, because it's an institution. Uh, then I repeat, if and when any trace of the archaic and medieval institutions of sovereignty have disappeared once for all, there is no sovereignty anymore, because he believes that there was sovereignty institutional, and then the question is, what do we do after, after? In two days, catastrophic state of abandonment. And I quote, the word of accumulation is a word that has got rid of the values of traditional sovereignty, 
and only the man of sovereign art, it's the end of the book, the last five pages of the book, the man of sovereign art is able to measure himself up uh, to the overweening catastrophe in which we are living. It's almost the end of the, the, what remains of the book, and the man of sovereign art, by which Bataille, uh, as in view himself and Nietzsche, because there are no others, of course, only himself and Nietzsche, uh, lives more or less as though he were, Bataille says, the last man. He is the one who keeps a memory of what sovereignty was or could have been. I, was, I have one more page, then uh, be, uh, be uh, patient. He keeps the memory of an impossible sovereignty. This is not exactly, of course, what Agamben had, uh, the way Agamben has since formalized the paradox of sovereignty. The reference to the last man is a belated an almost unnoticeable echo to what Bataille had written in 1943, so many years before, in his first book. On the last page of the central section of his inner experience, a section called The Torment, where he writes the following, it's one sentence, Bataille is writing. He says, Blanchot tells me, why not carry on the inner experience as though I were the last man? And then, I cannot give the explanations. Just, it's inspiring. But let us short circuit all explanations and summarize in one simple formulation, formulation what happens here. The last man is the survivor. Of what? Mm, of the catastrophe of sovereignty. Beyond all paradoxes of sovereignty, we need a phenomenology of the survivor in order to be able to account for the essential connection between the inner experience, which as we know has its own authority within itself, and is sovereign for that very reason, because the inner experience is sovereign. Uh, and the link between the inner experience and the institutional sovereignty of which the last man is the witness, the one who bears witness. He bears witness for the disappearance or for the impossibility of sovereignty. The real paradox then is only secondarily the one of sovereignty as Agamben would have it. The real paradox is that only the experience is sovereign. But actually, there is no witnessing for that sovereignty. What characterizes sovereignty is that there is no witnessing for the sovereignty. Sovereignty cannot be witnessed. It is this very simple reality that Bataille has constantly repeated, or if you prefer, that he has constantly experienced and, and uh, confronted with it. Sovereignty cannot be witnessed. The sovereign subject cannot be the witness of himself. Well, which means that he cannot be a subject. Because the definition of the subject is that he is the witness of himself, after all. Before the revolution of the subject, before this mysterious event in the Western world through which the word subject changed its meaning and received the opposite meaning, uh, through which consequently the subject became the sovereign, there was supposedly a possibility of witnessing sovereignty in its institutional forms. And this is why Bataille has devoted a whole book to institutional sovereignty, because it's nothing else. But this was only the prehistory of the sovereign subject, the time when everyone could have an image for sovereignty under the guise of the institutional sovereign. Today, no witnessing is possible anymore. And if this, what, uh, if this is what Bataille has constantly repeated and experienced, writing after writing, page after page, then we can finally understand what he met with his famous sentence, the experience, it's almost a quote. Uh, the experience, he says, is for itself, is its own authority. Uh, and, uh, excuse me, but it needs 
an expiation. That's almost really a quote. The experience is for itself, its own authority, but it needs an expiation. This is the theorem of sovereignty. In the inner experience, Bataille, who nevertheless uh, needed an authority for his powerful state about, statement about authority, refers once again to Maurice Blanchot. Uh, he, Blanchot, would have told him the, the, uh, that the experience is its own authority. Blanchot me dit, in French, que l'expérience elle-même est l'autorité. Il ajoute au sujet de cette autorité qu'elle doit être expiée. Which is awkward because he, Bataille himself, uh, years before, in 1939, before, before he met Blanchot, of course, had written the exact same sentence for himself, by himself. He need, that didn't need any authority for saying that the experience is the authority. I quote, uh, it's in, uh, in uh, 1939 in an article called uh, La Folie de Nietzsche, uh, Nietzsche's Madness. Uh, who has once understood that only madness can bring man to his comple completion must choose with open eyes. No betrayal of what he discovered in the forms of shatters and tears will appear to him more hateful than art's faint deliriums. For if it is true that he must become the victim of his own laws, the victim of his own laws, if it is true that the accomplishment of his destiny requires his ruin, then the very love of life and destiny demands that he commits first in himself the crime of authority that he will expiate. It's exactly the same idea, then the crime of authority that needs an expiation, and Bataille had written this himself without any reference to Blanchot in 1939. In, I read this sentence in French. S'il est vrai qu'il doit devenir la victime de ses propres lois, S'il est vrai que l'accomplissement de son destin demande sa perte, l'amour même de la vie et du destin veut qu'il commette tout d'abord en lui-même le crime d'autorité qu'il expira. Since the 18th century, then, the revolution of the subject has had as its most direct consequence that the subject from now on... Okay, re I repeat. Since the end of the 18th century, I say, uh, let's say Rousseau, Kant, the revolution of the subject has had as its most direct consequence that the subject from now on obeys his, his own laws. That's what the subject is. Uh, before I said he is his own witness, but you know, he is also the one who obeys himself. That's why he is the, uh, the subject. Uh, then, uh, it has its most direct consequence that the subject from now on obeys his own laws, for, and for that very reason is now a sovereign, because he, he obeys his own laws, the, or the laws that he himself has addictive. Bataille, after Nietzsche, is the only one who, as his most intimate and powerful project, experienced and exposed this, the, this birth of the subject for what it is. This birth of the subject, this obeying one's own laws for what it was, which is what? Which is the ruin of the subject, which means very precisely, but in different terms, the impossibility of witnessing as a subject the fact of being a sovereign subject. I repeat, the impossibility of witnessing as a subject the fact of being a subject, a sovereign subject. There is no witnessing for that. And as Blanchot would say in 1957, in his last novel, The Last Man, because Blanchot wrote a novel called The Last Man, uh, in French, même Dieu a besoin d'un témoin. Even God needs a witness. Thank you very much. <laughs>